Africa and the Ad Council. You're listening to BostonFreeRadio.com. Hello and welcome to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic Dan Burke. Words on Film is a show to which you are listening on bostonfreeradio.com or WBCA. You are watching and listening to me on some real community access television or some community access TV station that was kind enough to pick up this broadcast. To them I say thank you. Or you are watching and listening to me on Facebook Live, either on my own personal page or on Boston Free Radio's Facebook page. Either way you could join me. I'm glad you could join me to discuss my favorite topic, which is movies. So today, in lieu of my regular reviews of movies, I'm going to have some other movies that I haven't reviewed yet stacking up. But today is my special Oscar pre-show. So I've got my tuxedo on and usually I've, I've said that you know I've, i'm all dressed up in my tuxedo but for those of you who are actually watching me on tv or on facebook you know damn well i don't dress up for for my radio show <laughs> maybe someday in the future i'll be able to start that but in the meantime before i get to my predictions of the oscars let me get into my first segment which is what's topping the box office these are the top 10 highest grossing films of this past weekend and number one at the box office should be a surprise to no one it is black panther which did have a drop from last weekend last weekend which was a holiday weekend it grossed well internationally 404 million dollars this weekend, it grossed $111.7 million at the U.S. box office. And around the world, it has so far grossed $709 million, and that is against a budget of $200 million, making Black Panther the highest-grossing movie by an African-American director not adjusted to inflation. Not adjusted to inflation, it's beaten the previous record holder, which was the movie Stir Crazy, which came out in 1982. I want to say. It starred Richard Pryor and Gene Wilder and was directed by Sidney Poitier. But yeah, Black Panther has sur- surpassed that not adjusted to inflation, but adjusted to inflation, I think it's Black Panther's on its way to beating Stir Crazy. But either way, it's doing really well and it is a certified hit here in the States and around the world in just two weeks. The highest grossing debut movie of the week is Game Night, which grossed $17 million at the U.S. box office this weekend and $21.8 million worldwide against a budget of $37 million. So Game Night has a little bit less to lose than Black Panther does, especially given that its budget is literally one-fourth, less than a, a quarter of Black Panther's budget. But Game Night is still off to a really good start, but it is not a hit yet here in the States or around the world. Peter Rabbit was number two at the box office last week. This week is number three, having grossed just $12.8 million. And it's doing pretty well to give its budget. Against a budget of $50 million, Peter Rabbit has so far grossed $71.5 million here in the States and $74.6 million worldwide. Now, I'm actually very surprised that Peter Rabbit's not doing better overseas. I mean, in every other country besides the United States, it has grossed less than $3 million. Two point nine million to be exact by most estimates. But it still surpassed its budget, making it a tentative hit here in the States and around the world. Annihilation is the second highest grossing debut movie of the week, but the fourth highest grossing movie of this past weekend, having grossed $11.1 million, and that's against a budget of $55 million. That $11.1 million, by the way, is in the United States, so Annihilation is not off to a very good start, despite very strong reviews. And that's a movie I'll be reviewing in two weeks. I did see it this weekend, but I'm not going to be reviewing it for this show. But the international numbers for this movie I don't have number five at the box office 50 freaking shades freed that's not the official title of the movie but that's what I'm going to call it because I am so sick of seeing this movie the 50 shades franchise is like the Kadoba of movies I see it everywhere but I don't know anyone who actually likes it or even finds it sexy but 
Personal opinions aside, it is number five at the box office. It get, it did grow seven point one million dollars this past weekend against a budget of fifty five million dollars. Fifty Shades Free is so far grossed eighty nine point eight million dollars here in the states and a staggering three hundred twenty point four million dollars worldwide, making it a tentative hit here in the states because people in the states finally catch on that this movie franchise sucks. But around the world, it is unfortunately a certified hit. Moving on. Jumanji, Welcome to the Jungle, in its 10th week in release, has never left the top 10. But it's number 6 at the box office this weekend, falling from number 4 last week, having grossed just $5.7 million. But against a budget ranging from $90 to $110 million, exact budget yet to be determined jumanji welcome to the jungle has so far grossed 387.3 million dollars here in the states and 921 million dollars worldwide which means two things one it's a certified hit here in the states and around the world and two there will probably be a jumanji sequel or two or maybe even six but we'll have to see the 1517 to Paris in its third week in release is number seven at the box office, having dropped from number five last week. This weekend, the 1517 to Paris made $3.6 million against a budget of $30 million. That's three zero million dollars. The 1517 to Paris has made $32.2 million here in the States and $45.2 million worldwide. So for a movie that didn't get stellar reviews, it's doing relatively well, but it is a tentative hit, not a certified hit here in the States and around the world, and will probably remain a tentative hit here in the States. The Greatest Showman is also, like Jumanji Welcome to the Jungle, a movie that has never left the top 10 so far in its 10-week run. It grossed $3.4 million at the U.S. box office this weekend. Against a budget of $84 million, The Greatest Showman has so far grossed $160.8 million here in the States and $361.5 million worldwide. It is very close to being a certified hit here in the States, but it is not yet, but it eventually will be. Around the world, though, it is most certainly certified. Every Day is the third highest grossing debut movie of the week, but number nine at the box office this weekend, having grossed $3 million even. And that's against a budget of $4.9 million, which means it's not a hit yet, but it's coming very close, and I don't have the international numbers for you. And finally, Early Man, number 10 at the box office, having grossed $1.8 million this past weekend. Against a budget of $50 million, Early Man has so far grossed only $6.9 million here in the States and $31 million worldwide which means it's not a hit yet here in the States or around the world, and it's not looking good for Early Man, which is unfortunate because it's actually a pretty decent film, and I'm surprised that it's not doing better internationally. I'm probably okay to have one more drink before I drive home. I'm probably okay. I open the window to stay alert. Probably okay. I just popped some gum in my mouth. Step out of the car, please. I probably made a mistake. Probably okay isn't okay when it comes to drinking and driving. If you see a warning sign, stop and call a cab, a car, or a friend. Buzzed driving is drunk driving. A message brought to you by NHTSA and the Ad Council. Welcome to Mr. Bear's Violet Hour Saloon, where the sky is evening gorgeous, the drinks won't cloud your head, and the cocktail nuts are poems. Join me, Mr. Bear, every Tuesday at 8 p.m. Boston time, on bostonfreeradio.com for music, poetry, fiction, interviews, and more. Making the lonely a little more bearable. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke, and just as a reminder, Words on Film is a show to which you are listening on WBCA and bostonfreeradio.com, watching on SCAT-V or some community access TV station that was kind enough to pick up this broadcast, and to them I say thank you, or you are watching and listening to me on Facebook Live, either on my own personal page or on Boston Free Radio's Facebook page. Either way you could join me, I'm glad you could join me to discuss my favorite topic, which is movies. And today is my special pre-Oscar show. So, I used to say in the past when I hosted this show that I've got my tuxedo on, but those of you who are watching me on TV know know damn well that I don't dress up for this. (laughs) I like to dress nicely, or at least show that I have some good hygiene or at least uh, some decent uh, (laughs) sense of styles but 
<laughs> you guys know I don't dress up that much for this show. But either way, I'm really excited because I get to discuss the Oscar nominees. And I'm going to give my predictions for them. A lot of the major awards I've gotten right over the last couple of years. But a lot of the, the minor ones, especially when they come to documentaries, I haven't quite gotten those. But the first category I'd like to discuss for you right now is actually the nominees for Best short film in the live action category. So I actually got the chance to see these films this past weekend, and I'm going to kind of summarize them for you during this break. In the next break, I'm going to go into the best animated short film. So definitely stay tuned for that. So anyway, best live action short films. The nominees are DeKalb Elementary, The Silent Child, My Nephew Emmett, the 11 o'clock, and Watu Wote, all of us. So let me discuss DeKalb Elementary first, and I'm going to be very brief on these descriptions. So DeKalb Elementary takes place in an unspecified part of the United States, but it takes place in an elementary school. I presumed it was Atlanta, Georgia for two reasons. One, Atlanta is located in DeKalb County in Atlanta, Georgia. And two, the people who worked in the elementary school in this movie were mostly black. I don't think I saw a white person in this film. But anyway, the movie gets going when it focuses on the reception desk at this elementary school, and a white man walks in and asks to use the phone. But then he pulls something out of his backpack. And... Well, I'm going to spoil a little bit here, but this happens in the first two minutes of the film. He pulls out a, a semi-automatic rifle, and you guys pretty much know how this is going to go afterwards. And I, I do have to say that this film rings very true to recent events, not to mention the Florida shooting. And as I was watching this, I was I was thinking how shocked I was, first of all, but I also thought to myself... If I was watching a film that was made like this 10 years ago, I would think to myself, there is no way someone would walk in to an elementary school and even threaten to shoot someone, let alone shoot kids. But unfortunately, that's become the reality of our life and times here. So the timing of DeKalb Elementary could not be better in terms of this film getting released. As for whether or not it was nominated because of recent events, I really can't say. But moving on to the next film. The DeKalb Elementary, by the way, was made by a uh, U.S. crew. The second film on the list is The Silent Child. And this is a film that was made in Great Britain. And it's about a young girl who's deaf. She's probably about four or five. And her family hires a tutor to help her speak. And this movie really had some very touching moments. And as I'm watching the, the live-action short films, I, I begin to think to myself, would I want to see this film in a, a full length, maybe 80 to 120 minutes? And in the case of DeKalb Elementary, I, I'm not quite sure. But The Silent Child, I would love to see that full length. I think it was a very touching story, and it had a very poignant message at the very end of it about deaf children in in our educational system. Not our educational system being the United States, but education systems around the free world. So The Silent Child was a, was a great movie in that respect. The third movie was My Nephew Emmett, which was also made in the United States. And I'm not used to seeing familiar faces in these nominees for short films, but in this case, I did actually see a familiar face in My Nephew Emmett. I saw acting in this film uh, the actress Jasmine Guy, who's best known for her acting in the TV show A Different World, but she's also been in various movies and uh, stage shows. She's an actress I really admire, so it's great to see her in this film. But My Nephew Emmett tells a semi-fictional account of the controversy that Emmett Till stirred up in rural Mississippi when he, as a native of Chicago, went there to visit relatives. Well, it turns out he allegedly made a catcall to a white woman, and if you guys want to know his fate, look it up, because I'm not going to get into it right here, not only because I, I 
don't have a lot of time but it this is a movie that's also really touching and really sad and also shot and acted extremely well the next movie comes from australia and it's called the 11 o'clock and this movie reminded me very much of a sketch of monty python because it involves a psychiatrist who's dealing with a patient who also thinks he's a psychiatrist and after the heavy-handed drama of the previous three films i laughed a lot at the 11 o'clock it was a very well-made film and also had some great comic timing and the fifth film it was one that came from a German crew, but it was filmed in Somalia, and it was called Watu Wote, All of Us. And it's about a woman from Somalia who's crossing the border from Somalia into Kenya, and this is also based on a true story. And again, I don't have a lot of time to get into the details, but all five of these films, I'd give them all my rating of knockout, but now it's my job to determine the best of the best of the best. And if I were to w- wager a guess as to which one would win, it would probably be DeKalb Elementary. Again, it's really hard to choose from the best of the best of the best, but this is the one that had probably the most profound impact on me. I thought it was extremely well acted, very tense, and very very relevant to what's happening in today's world. So my pick for best live action short film, DeKalb Elementary. Come on, smile. Oh, honey, he's still not smiling. Maybe he's not a smiler. Yeah, maybe he's just not a happy baby. Maybe he's just being a boy. Or maybe he's teething. Maybe it's just a phase. Maybe he has autism, and we can definitely do something to help. Maybe is all you need to find out more about autism. No big, joyful smiles by six months is one early sign. Learn the others at AutismSpeaks.org slash signs. Brought to you by Autism Speaks and the Ad Council. Diane Wong here, announcing a new radio program, Let's talk about race. From our beginnings as a white supremacist society to our current existence as a white supremacist society, race is a topic that affects us all, and yet we have difficulty talking about it. Why is race so difficult? Why can't we talk openly about white supremacy? Why don't we like to talk about white privilege? Why is internalized oppression shrouded in mystery? What about lynching? What about gerrymandering and the current Black Lives Matters debate? We'll talk about all of it. Come and join us Thursdays from 7 to 8 p.m. Let's talk about race. Boston Free Radio. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke, continuing my special edition show of the pre-Oscar predictions. The next category I'm going to discuss in length is the category for best animated short film. And this has been my complaint for a number of years. I actually had the pleasure of seeing two of the five animated films previously over the course of 2017 before seeing all five of them back to back this past weekend. They're all excellent, but I've always been a proponent of movie studios bringing the short film back, both animated and live action. I would love to see movie theaters from art house cinemas to cineplexes bring the short film back, whether it be animated or live action. We need the short films because I don't think that I think I think people are kind of phased by the previews that go on in the beginning of a movie. I mean, now, since we're in the internet age of getting our previews from YouTube, IMDb, the Apple Movie Trailer site, and various other places, I think we can tone down, but not completely eradicate the coming attractions. But I think people would benefit from seeing more short films before feature films. But with that said, let me get into the nominees for Best Animated Short Film. The nominees are... Dear Basketball from the United States, Negative Space from Australia, Lou from the United States, Revolting Rhymes from the United Kingdom, and Garden Party from France. So let me get into detail about what these short films are about. Dear Basketball is a very short film that's hand-drawn animation, and it's actually narrated by Kobe Bryant and written by Kobe Bryant. I don't know what motivated Kobe Bryant to write this essay. It might have been for 
it might have been for Sports Illustrated. It might have been specifically for this movie. I don't know. But either way, this is a movie that's very well animated. And I my respect for Kobe Bryant has been middling over the last couple of years, particularly because I'm a diehard, well, Boston sports fanatic in general, especially you don't mess with my Celtics. And I... I cried tears of joy when the Celtics beat the Kobe Bryant-led Lakers in 2008, and I was absolutely ticked off when Kobe Bryant beat the Celtics in the NBA Finals in 2010. So I do have a bias towards Kobe Bryant. I get that. But with that said, Dear Basketball was very well animated, and my respect for Kobe Bryant has increased some, particularly because I liked how he described his love for basketball. It in spite of how well the movie was animated. So, moving on, the next movie was Negative Space, which is also a surprisingly short one, and this one was stop-motion animation. It came from Australia, and it's about a man who is describing how he connected with his father in the oddest way. In other words, (laughs) from learning how to pack a suitcase from his father. And it's interesting to see the unique ways that this this man, this narrator, describes how he packs a suitcase. It's certainly not the way I pack my duffel bag whenever I go on a trip, but if I ever wanted to pack a suitcase, then I would probably take I would probably go to Negative Space for some more information on that. But Negative Space is also a really good film. The other animated nomination is Lou, which actually comes from Pixar Studios. And Lou was played right before Cars 3. So even though Coco was nominated for Best feature-length animated film and not Cars 3, the short that came before Cars 3 was better than the one that came before Coco. In fact, people were really ticked off about the the short film that came before Coco, which was, it was one with Olaf, the snowman from Frozen, and it was called Olaf's Frozen Holiday. And I thought it was okay. Some people really hated it. But rest assured, Lou was a better short. I I'm going to get into exactly, well, which which animated film I think should win, but Lou is a somewhat supernatural story that takes place on a playground, and it's about an unseen character that lives in a lost and found box on a playground and has an encounter with a school bully on the playground. So, very typical of Pixar animated films. This one's very well animated and tells a unique story despite having minimal dialogue. The fourth film that's nominated is Revolting Rhymes, which is a CGI animated film from Great Britain based on a book of the same name by Raul Dahl and what was originally illustrated by Quentin Blake. And this is a film I also saw during 2017, and I thought it was very good. It certainly had the Raul Dahl text and the unique rhyming for which Raul Dahl's not especially well known, but it worked very well in his Fractured Fairy Tales here. So I thought Revolting Rhymes was also a great film. And finally, the last nominee from France is one called Garden Party, which you think initially is going to be a children's film at first, but the last 30 seconds are pretty disturbing. It starts out innocently enough showing frogs, CGI animated frogs, um, jumping from lily lily pad to lily pad and then they encounter an abandoned house but as they're going around comically trying you know testing out the waters in the pool and eating the snacks that are left around you begin to wonder why is such a nice house as this so empty and then you eventually find more and more features that lead to clues that there's something sinister about this rendezvous upon which the frogs are undertaking so of my choices for the five films which one do i think will win or which one do i think will deserve to win my choice is garden party because this movie was exquisitely animated the frogs in the movie looked real and it certainly reminded me of certain 
Pixar animated films. I think maybe Lou from Disney Pixar will come in as the favorite, but I'm rooting for Garden Party because I thought it actually told a better story and it had much, much better animation. Not to mention, it comes from an underdog studio in France. So, those are the nominees for Best Short Animated Feature and... I definitely suggest that if you see these playing at your local theater, check them out. And if they're not playing at your local theater, definitely look them up on YouTube because if they're not there now, they will be in a few months. But all five of them are great. I just think Garden Party is the best of the best of the best. Hi, we're the Goo Goo Dolls. We're fortunate that our daughters have what they need to grow and learn. But that isn't the case for nearly 13 million kids in the U.S. that struggle with hunger. Childhood hunger is a heartbreaking reality that Feeding America is working to change. Each year, the Feeding America network of food banks rescues billions of pounds of good food that would have gone to waste and provides it to families and children in need. You can help kids in need in your community by visiting feedingamerica.org. Brought to you by Feeding America and the Ad Council. Hey everybody, this is Sleaze Grinder, host of the Heavy Leather Topless Dance Party, the most dangerous show on television. But if your eyes are tired, guess what? Now you can listen to it. The Heavy Leather Topless Dance Party is now on Boston Free Radio Sundays at 7 p.m. Right here on Boston Free Radio. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. And for those of you who have tuned into the show late, this is my special pre-Oscar edition of Words on Film. This is where I go through the nominees and I give you who I think will be the winners and or who I think should be the winners. And I'm also going to add a certain subset of a category this year where I'm going to predict who is probably best most likely to pull off an upset so with that said i'm going to save the best picture category for last but i'm going to go right into the acting categories so for best actor in a leading role the nominees are timothy chalamet for call me by your name daniel day lewis phantom thread daniel kaluuya for get out gary oldman for darkest hour and Denzel Washington for Roman J. Israel Esquire. So, for this category, who I think will win and who I think should win are both the same. Who I think will and should win? Gary Oldman for Darkest Hour. The the Academy likes transformations, and especially when these transformations are done extremely well. And Gary Oldman is virtually unrecognizable here as Winston Churchill, but I also think he happened to do the best job, not just a Winston Churchill imitation. Now, if there's one actor out of these five, out of these four, who I predict won't win, who might pull off an upset, it will probably be Daniel Day-Lewis for Phantom Thread. That might be, but my bets are on Gary Oldman for Darkest Hour because I think he did the best job and I think after years of not winning an Oscar he deserves to win so on to best actress in a leading role the nominees are Sally Hawkins for The Shape of Water Frances McDormand Three Billboards Outside Ebbing, Missouri Margot Robbie I, Tanya, Saoirse Ronan for Lady Bird and Meryl Streep for The Post. So, again, just like the actor category, a combination of who I think will win and should win, I think of these five fine actresses, Frances McDormand, Three Billboards Outside Ebbing, Missouri. I think this is probably Frances McDormand's best role since Fargo, and, I, and also it's a lot more complex than her role in in Fargo. Also, I think Three Billboards Outside Ebbing, Missouri is one of the films that just barely didn't make my top 10 list. I wanted to put it there, but I saw so many great films in 2017. But it's a film that's stayed with me for quite some time, especially Frances McDormand's performance. If there was an actress of these five who could potentially pull off an upset, the best chance upset would probably be Sir Ronan for Lady Bird. And I'm, I'm torn between either Sir Ronan or Sally Hawkins, but I would probably go with Sir Ronan because I, I think people are just beginning to recognize how great an actress Sir Ronan is, and people besides me are finally 
pronouncing her first name right. Yeah, when I reviewed her back when she did the movie Brooklyn, I I mispronounced her name as Sour Earsay, but if you look at the way her name's spelled, you wouldn't blame me for making that error. So anyway, on to the supporting roles. The nominees are... Uh, for, oh, for Best Actor in a Supporting Role. The nominees are, in alphabetical order, by last name, Willem Dafoe, The Florida Project, Woody Harrelson, Three Billboards Outside Ebbing, Missouri, Richard Jenkins, The Shape of Water, Christopher Plummer, All the Money in the World, and Sam Rockwell, Three Billboards Outside Ebbing, Missouri. So, this is another one of these categories who I think will win and who I think should win, which are not necessarily the same, but they but they are in this case. I think the winner is going to be Sam Rockwell for Three Billboards Outside Ebbing, Missouri. Sam Rockwell did a fantastic job in this movie. I think he outshone just about everyone except Francis McDormand, and his role was very complex and also mesmerizing. If there's one actor... In fact, I have about two actors who I think might pull off an upset, so I'll just mention them both. The first actor who I think will be most likely to pull off an upset would probably be Christopher Plummer for All the Money in the World. Now, All the Money in the World is a movie I've seen, but I haven't actually reviewed it for this show yet. But Christopher Plummer could pull off an upset not only because he did a great job in that movie, but also because, A, it took his scene nine days to shoot. That's it, nine days. And for an actor in his late 80s, that's not very easy to do, especially since films take 11 to 14 hours a day to to shoot. And secondly, Christopher Plummer had the arduous task of overtaking a role that Kevin Spacey had filmed in his entirety. I thought that was a drastic step, but Christopher Plummer excelled at taking over Kevin Spacey's role, and I don't need to tell you why. The second most likely person to to upset Sam Rockwell would probably be Willem Dafoe for The Florida Project. Now, Willem Dafoe is an actor who's been nominated a few times for Oscars, but he's never won, and this understated role in a really great movie again another one of my favorites that didn't quite make my top 10 list and Willem Dafoe's performance stood out amongst all the great performances in that film so now on to the next category best actress in a supporting role the nominees are Mary J. Blige Mudbound Allison Janney I, Tanya, Leslie Manville Phantom Thread Lori Metcalf Lady Bird and Octavia Spencer, The Shape of Water. Now, taking into account that I did not see Mudbound, at least not yet, my prediction for who will win is probably going to be Allison Janney for I, Tanya. I think she's coming in as a favorite, and she's she's great in I, Tanya, and probably the, the best actor in the film, period. And I did think Margot Robbie was miscast, but again, Allison Janney certainly was not. If there's somebody who I think should win and or who might pull off an upset, combining those this time, it would probably be Lori Metcalf for Lady Bird. This is her very first time nominated. She's been acting for a really long time, mostly, probably in more um, uh, TV than films, but... Here, she had a standout performance in Lady Bird, certainly playing also a very complex character. And I've only got a couple of seconds left, but I promise you, more nominees and more predicted winners, they are going to be coming up very shortly, so definitely stay tuned. 180 over 111, and I had a stroke. I couldn't speak or walk. 150 over 90, and I had a stroke. This is what high blood pressure sounds like. You might not feel its symptoms, but the results from a stroke are far from silent. Get back on your treatment plan or talk with your doctor to create a plan that works for you. Go to loweryourhpp.org. I had to tell everything's changed. Brought to you by the American Stroke Association, American Medical Association, and the Ad Council. BFR. BostonFreeRadio.com. This is Alan Patterson, and I want to invite you all to tune into my music radio show, Voices of Time, heard live each and every Wednesday from 3 to 5 p.m. Eastern Time on Boston Free Radio at bostonfreeradio.com. 
Voices of Time, while founded on the golden age of music from the 60s and 70s in all its permutations, also visits other eras and many genres. We feature rock and roll from its original era and beyond, rock in all its variations including prog, psychedelia, garage and punk, Motown, old school R&B, soul, blues, jazz, gospel, folk, old school country, zydeco, all music New Orleans, rockabilly, bluegrass, world music, comedy, poetry, and spoken word, and much more. Please come and join me for an adventurous two-hour ride into the stratosphere of sound where the voices of time reverberate for all eternity. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke, and this is our special Oscar edition of Words on Film, where I give you the nominees for the Oscars, which are this coming Sunday, March 4th, and also who I think will win, who I think should win, and who I think may pull off an upset. So, now we're on to the directing categories. The nominees for Best Director are... Christopher Nolan, Dunkirk. Jordan Peele, Get Out. Greta Gerwig, Lady Bird. Paul Thomas Anderson, Phantom Thread. And Guillermo del Toro for The Shape of Water. Now, this is a really, really tough category because all these directors did amazing jobs. And it's also of significance because Jordan Peele and Greta Gerwig are amongst the few black men and women respectively to be nominated for this category but if i were to choose who i think should win best director and this is a tough one it's probably going to be dunkirk um christopher nolan i i think christopher nolan did an amazing job he certainly had made this film significant both on on land in air and in sea and there was no actor who stood out in this film i think everybody here pulled their own weight and certainly the 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 crew pulled their own weight as well so if there was a a director who could potentially pull off an upset the most likely candidate would be Guillermo del Toro for The Shape of Water. Because again, he tells a very odd tale that's a love story adaptation of The Creature of the Black Lagoon. But he tells this tale so well that people who don't especially like science fiction have loved The Shape of Water. The mo- the second most likely person to pull off an upset is probably going to be Greta Gerwig for Lady Bird. Because again, she paints a, a poignant portrait of a young woman who's coming into her own in terms of her identity and also trying to get away from her family as she's leaving high school and going off to college. I think Greta Gerwig did a great directorial job her first time out, and I'd love to see more of what she directs, because I think her acting was getting a little redundant, but as a director, she's fantastic. So... Who do I think will win? I'm going to go on a, go out on a limb and say Christopher Nolan will win for Dunkirk. But I'm torn between him and Guillermo del Toro. But in any event, now on to the writing categories. For Best Adapted Screenplay, the nominees are Call Me By Your Name, The Disaster Artist, Logan, Molly's Game, and Mudbound. So... Who do I think will win? Judging from what I've read and some of the hype surrounding some of these movies, my guess is probably going to be Call Me By Your Name. Again, it's it's a movie I didn't especially love, but I know a lot of other people loved it. And if there's a movie that could potentially pull off an upset, wow, I, I can't really say because I would probably I'd probably go with Molly's game which was written for the screen by Aaron Sorkin, who also directed the film. Because if there's anything about Aaron Aaron Sorkin, he writes incredible dialogue. And even though his 
his characters and his, their dialogue can get a little bombastic and haughty. I, I think Molly's game had a very intelligent game of ping pong that was going on verbally between all the characters. So Molly's game may pull off an upset, but then again, I can't speak for Mudbound because as of right now, I haven't seen it. So now on to Best Original Screenplay. The nominees are The Big Sick, Get Out, Lady Bird, The Shape of Water, and Three Billboards Outside Ebbing, Missouri. Now, it's interesting to note that Dunkirk wasn't nominated for any of these categories. It probably would have been nominated for Best Original Screenplay, but then again, neither was Darkest Hour. But in any event... I think the movie that will win Best Original Screenplay is The Shape of Water. And as I said, this is a movie that a lot of people have loved, even those who aren't science fiction fans or aren't especially big fans of the macabre. But in any event, The Shape of Water had a legitimately great love story in it and i think people really identified with that if there's a movie to pull off an upset and this might be a long shot it might be the big sick again the big sit the big sick was a fantastic movie it had a great deal of comedy and drama not only was it acted incredibly well and snubbed for a few acting categories but it also had great dialogue and certainly some some legitimately sad dramatic moments so i think the big sick might actually upset the shape of water but then again three billboards outside ebbing missouri might upset them both as well so, those are the writing categories. Let me get into Best Animated Feature Film. This is kind of a favorite of mine. The nominees are Boss Baby, The Breadwinner, Coco, Ferdinand, and Loving Vincent. So, who do I think will win and who do I think should win this category? Coco. Undoubtedly. This is one of the best films of the year. Boss Baby and Ferdinand don't have a chance against Coco. I thought it told a wonderful story, and it made the land of the dead, um, De Los Muertos, look beautiful in this film. I don't know how to say land in Spanish, so <laughs> um, for, forgive my, my high school knowledge of Spanish. If there's a movie that might pull off an upset, it would probably be Loving Vincent, because Loving Vincent not only told an amazing story, but it also had unique, beautiful animation, like watching a Van Gogh painting or an oil painting come to life. And you have to really see Loving Vincent to believe how great it is. But fortunately, Loving Vincent is out on DVD and Blu-ray and will probably be available for streaming soon if you haven't seen it already. But for Best Animated Feature Film, my guess is going to be Coco. So, on to Documentary. The nominees are Abacus, Small Enough to Jail, Faces Places, Icarus, Last Man in Aleppo, and Strong Island. And I'll tell you this much. I am terrible at choosing the nominees for, or rather the winners for Best Documentary. My money's going to go on Abacus, Small Enough to Jail, but considering that I have not actually seen the other four documentaries, don't take my word on it, but my money is on Abacus just making a risk. In the wake of a disaster, what one thing can you send that will help people the most? A blanket, a tent, a sandbag, a doctor. Actually, if you send a monetary donation, you send all these things. Even a small donation can make a big impact and can quickly become exactly what people affected by disaster need most. In the wake of a hurricane, your monetary donation can make a huge difference to those in need. To donate, visit supporthurricanerelief.org. That's supporthurricanerelief.org. Brought to you by the Ad Council. I love those real sick sons They're the ones that move me A thinly blown Neurotic toe Intensify and groove me all this and more on Unpopular Music, Saturdays at noon on Boston Free Radio. 
Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke, and I'm continuing my discussion of the Oscar nominations, who I think will win, who I think should win, and who might pull off an upset. So now I've discussed in length a lot of the arts categories, and I'm going to get to the big one at the very end, the best picture category, but here's a, a couple of science categories, because it is, after all, the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences. So for Best Cinematography, let's start with that. The nominees are Blade Runner 2049, Darkest Hour, Dunkirk, Mudbound, and The Shape of Water. And my pick for Best Cinematography has to be Dunkirk. And that's by Hatye Van Hoytema. I hope I pronounced that that name right, but that person did the cinematography for Dunkirk. And again, Dunkirk covered the that battle in 1940 by land, by sea, and by air, and it did it so well that that's really the movie that beat. If there's a potential upset in this category, it's probably going to be The Shape of Water, especially because of the the cool underwater shots they had, not to mention Guillermo del Toro and cinematographer Dan Laustin's, Laustin's um, you, very unique and appropriate use of slow motion in these underwater shots. But I, I think it's going to be Dunkirk that's going to win this one. And I, again, I can't speak for Mudbound's chances, but compared to Dunkirk, I, I don't think it could be better. But that's only because I haven't seen Mudbound. So for Best Costume Design, the nominees are Beauty and the Beast, the live-action remake, Darkest Hour, Phantom Thread, The Shape of Water, and Victoria and Abdul. Who do I think will win and who do I think should win? Both Phantom Thread, undoubtedly. If the movie is about costume making and this movie does an incredible job remaking such costuming styles from the 40s and 50s, I think that Phantom Thread is the movie to beat. A movie that could pull off a potential upset would probably be Beauty and the Beast, followed in third place by Victoria and Abdul, but I don't think The Shape of Water or Darkest Hour holds a candle, especially to The Phantom Thread, even though these films looked authentically like their time period. In, in which they took place. So, on to film editing. The nominees for Best Film Editing are Baby Driver, Dunkirk, I, Tanya, The Shape of Water, and Three Billboards Outside Ebbing, Missouri. My pick for this is Dunkirk. Again, for all the reasons I mentioned, because editing has a lot to do with timing, and Dunkirk had some great timing in it. But also, Baby Driver came off as sort of a sleeper hit of this past year, and I, I, I wouldn't... I would probably say that Baby Driver might upset Dunkirk, but the movie that's probably most likely to upset Dunkirk would probably be The Shape of Water. But again, we'll have to see. So, for the foreign language film category, let me get into this before I get into, um, well, an another science category. The nominees for Best Foreign Language Film are A Fantastic Woman from Chile, The Insult from Lebanon, Loveless from Russia, On Body and Soul from Hungary, and The Square from Sweden. So, I have not seen three out of the five movies nominated in this category. I actually was going to see A Fantastic Woman this weekend, but I ultimately ran out of time. But I would probably go for, if I were to guess, put my money on something like I do with the documentary category, it would probably be The Insult, because I, I thought that was the most deeply affecting movie. The Square, I thought, was a little all over the place, but it certainly did have some merits, but again, I can't speak for A Fantastic Woman, Loveless, or On Dub Body and Soul, so any of those three films might upset the insult, but I doubt The Square is going to win. Now on to makeup and hairstyling. The nominees are Darkest Hour, Victoria and Abdul, and Wonder. Now, Wonder is noteworthy because that made Jacob Tremblay look unrecognizable in his in in his role in this m movie and that might be a favorite to win particularly because it probably made more money than Darkest Hour or Victoria and Abdul but I think 
Victoria and Abdul might be the movie to beat, but then again, movies with elaborate makeup, unlike Darkest Hour and Victoria and Abdul, have one before, such as the Nutty Professor movie with Eddie Murphy. So my bet is on Wonder, but then again, I might be wrong about that. So now on to Best Original Song. The nominees are Mighty River from the movie Mudbound, Mystery of Your Name from Call Me By Your Name, Remember Me from Coco, Stand Up for Something from Marshall, and This Is Me from The Greatest Showman. So, who do I think will win? Who do I think should win? Remember Me from Coco. That's the movie of the five films here. Well, four, uh, three films that I've seen. That's the one I remember the best, uh, ironically, given its title. If there's a song to upset that, it's probably going to be This Is Me from The Greatest Showman. But now I'm running a little bit out of time, so I, I couldn't get into score or production design or anything like that. But I'm now going to get into Best Picture before I wrap up my talk about the 90th annual Oscars. So, the nominees for Best Picture. The nominees are Call Me By Your Name, Darkest Hour, Dunkirk, Get Out, Lady Bird, Phantom Thread, The Post, The Shape of Water, and Three Billboards Outside Ebbing, Missouri. Again, that arduous task of choosing the best of the best of the best. And I have to go with who do I think will win, who do I think should win. Both those combined my money is on Dunkirk. Again, it is the greatest war movie since Saving Private Ryan. It certainly was the most intriguing, and that's what I'm going to go with. If there's a movie to upset it, it's probably going to be The Shape of Water. Probably the most likely to upset Dunkirk for Best Picture, but my money is on Dunkirk. I thought it was an amazing film. It was my second favorite movie of the year. Uh, The first didn't even get get nominated for a single thing, but uh, that that's another story for another time. So I hope you enjoyed my Dan Burke's takes on the Oscar nominees. And for next week's show, I'm going to reveal the Oscar nominees, the Oscar winners, and also the Razzie winners. So next week's going to be a really fun show. Man, do I love card night. You ready, boys? You got a king? Go fish that! Oh, come on! <laughs> this is WWE superstar Titus O'Neil. It only takes a moment to make a moment. Take time to be a dad today. Learn more at 877-4DAD-411 or visit fatherhood.gov. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services and the Ad Council. Every Tuesday at 3, something special happens on Boston Free Radio. Why, it's Toppers! With your host, Gil. Toppers, spinning the tunes that today's youth demand. From Justin Bieber to Lady Gaga to the Fleetwoods. And, on occasion, Hoagie Carmichael. If you missed the program, you can check out the archives at Toppers Radio. That's one word, dot blogspot, dot C-O-M. Toppers. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke, and I just revealed my nominees for a lot of the major Oscar categories. It's going to be a great show, I predict. It's going to be hosted by Jimmy Kimmel, who did a great job hosting the show last year, and hopefully this time they don't flub up the award for best picture but in any event i'm going to be watching the show on march 4th i'm going to be live tweeting and it's going to be really really exciting i'm i'm always stoked for the oscars it's kind of like my my other super bowl and considering um i was rooting for the patriots in this year's super bowl i was needless to say pretty disappointed that they lost but then again the philadelphia eagles did do much better than the the Patriots in the game when everything was all said and done. But I'm going to be less disappointed by whoever wins the at the Academy Awards, except, even if they're, you know, maybe not my picks for the, the Oscar contenders. But in any event, now that my talk about the Oscars is done for the show, I'm going to get into my next segment, which is what's coming up next. These are the most high-profile movies, unless stated otherwise, that are coming out in theaters this coming weekend, the weekend of March 2nd, 2018. So the biggest movie, arguably, that's coming out this coming weekend is 
Red Sparrow, and this is the latest starring Jennifer Lawrence, and it also co-stars Joel Edgerton and Charlotte Rampling. It's about a ballerina by the name of Dominika Egorova, who is recruited to Sparrow School, a Russian intelligence service, where she is forced to use her body as a weapon. Ooh. Her first mission, targeting a CIA agent, threatens to unravel the security of both nations. I'm not sure how this movie's going to be, but it has Jennifer Lawrence in it playing a contract killer, so the fact that she is a former ballerina is also really intriguing. And I have not seen any previews of this movie, but it's a movie I will definitely see this weekend. And while I won't let you know how I think about it for next week's show, since next week's show is my favorite Oscar and Razzie recap, I will let you know about it uh, the show after next week's show so two weeks from now also coming out is a remake of the movie death wish which originally starred charles bronson i think there were four death wish movies and this time bruce willis is taking over charles bronson's role and bruce willis is a family man who becomes a vigilante killing machine when his family is violently attacked by robbers the director of this movie is eli roth and eli roth is not quite so well known for action films as much as he is campy horror films like Cabin Fever and Hostel, not to mention one half of, actually not one half, one of the previews in the underrated Grindhouse um, duo. But I'd be interested to see how Eli Roth does with this movie. The film, in addition to Bruce Willis, also stars Vincent D'Onofrio, Elizabeth Shue, and Camila Morone. And we'll see how this movie is. This is a movie I will definitely see this coming weekend. And I'll let you know about it in two weeks. Another movie that's coming out in theaters, at least in limited release, is one called Foxtrot. And this is one about a troubled family who face the fact when something goes terribly wrong at their son's desolate military post. The movie is directed by Samuel Maus, who is an Israeli director who previously directed such films as Lebanon and a couple of other shorts and documentaries. This one I'm not familiar with, and I don't think a lot of Western audiences will be familiar with this one, but it certainly sounds like an intriguing premise. Can't guarantee whether or not I'll see it, but it I'm at least intrigued by what I've read about it. And the last movie I'm going to mention before I sign off is going to be They Remain. This is a movie about two scientists who share a romantic history and are tasked with investigating unnatural animal behavior on the site of a Manson family-style cult's compound. This is another movie that sounds absolutely intriguing. It's directed by Philip Gelat, G-E-L-A-T-T, who has directed... She, he's actually written the screenplays for a video game called Rise of the Tomb Raider, which I haven't played. He wrote the screenplay for They Remain. uh, Duh, that's the movie I just mentioned. Um, He he directed previously a movie called The Bleeding House, which I have not heard of, but again, that sounds like a very creepy title, albeit it has nobody in it I know. But if you check out the the film They Remain, if, if it's in theaters near you, I would probably recommend seeing it if you're into those kind of thrillers because it sounds like a very intriguing premise to me. But anyway, that just about does it for this edition of Words on Film. Remember that Words on Film is the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke, and I'm very excited for this year's Oscars. They're going to be on March 4th at 8 p.m. on ABC, and ABC did not pay me to, en- to give you that endorsement, but if it was on C- CBS or NBC, I'd give it the same endorsement. So enjoy the Oscars if you're watching them. In the meantime, this is Dan Burke saying I'll see you at the movies.